Tom Clancy's The Division 2 introduces players to a war-torn Washington, D.C., a battleground not just in the streets, but the hearts and minds of its civilians as they fight to regain a semblance of order that is true to the values the city and its country are built upon. It's been seven months since the dollar flu destroyed New York City, and humanity is clawing back piece by piece, presenting a new game design challenge for developers' massive entertainment, building an open-world game that is dynamic, emergent, and immersive keeping players on their toes and giving a sense of life to the world. This leads to enemy factions wandering the open world looking for trouble, friendly survivors patrolling near their captured settlements, supply convoys that either need to be defended from enemies or raided for extra goodies, or supply caches airdropping into DC, resulting in all sorts of trouble. I'm Tommy Thompson of AI and Games, and in my recent discussion with Division 2's lead AI programmer Philip Dunstan, we discuss the process of building a system that allows for all these dynamic events to occur, the problems that arise when balancing these elements of systemic game design, and the challenges faced as the established tools and systems migrated from the bitter cold of New York City to the sunny streets of Washington, D.C. In New York, you could, you, know, you could stand on a street corner for a long period of time because the there was very few, very little movement through the open world. But in Washington, if you stand on a street corner for any length of time, you know, you are going to get engaged in, in combat with a group of NPCs moving through the world. In the first division, New York City is designated a quarantine zone. It's become a tomb, a monument to the devastating chemical attack just weeks prior, and hence the number of non-combative AI is relatively minimal, with pockets of scavenging enemies found throughout the open world. But as the franchise moves from the chilling winter winds of the Hudson to the warmer summer breeze of the Potomac, the team at Massive wanted to increase the impact and spread of both friendly and enemy non-player characters in the game map. As part of the immersion, we wanted to, to give the NPCs you know, a lot of purpose for being in, in the world. Um, and some of this came through our design. This was you know, six or nine months after the outbreak. Washington has you know, gone through this, you know, the phase where everything is, you know, is just madness and chaotic, and now it's sort of starting to, the civilians are starting to group together into settlements. And the settlements have structure, and the different, the different factions all have their own um, you know, strongholds, and they have, they have structure. And we wanted to make that apparent not just through the story, but through the player's experience of you know, seeing the NPCs you know, you know, interact and, and move through the, through the open world. To achieve this, the development team put together a living world activity system into The Division 2, giving specific roles to non-player characters as they enter the world and ensuring that they perform a given task or duty. So let's walk through how it all works, and then some of the weird and interesting problems that emerged as the existing AI systems were being adapted to work within the Washington DC map. We wanted Washington to feel much more alive. We wanted it to feel like th there was, you know, there was always something happening that you could easily find a group of civilians or a group of hyenas. And so it meant having, you know, a, the, a system that let, you know, NPCs, you know, move through the world. The activity system within the Division 2 allows for a variety of different sequences to be executed, each with their own objective. Throughout the execution of the sequence, an NPC will assume a role or duty within the world and is assigned to a post within a set space or region to operate within. What that means is when you see a group of NPCs travelling through the open world, be it as a patrol team near a stronghold, convoy moving between outposts, or as a unit gathering resources from an area with food or water, each NPC has a defined purpose within the activity to complete. As mentioned, each NPC has a given role or duty to complete for their assigned objective. These are split into two types. The special role, which is given to one or more NPCs at the beginning of the action being executed, or the unscripted role, which is assigned in an ad hoc fashion, depending on what's happening in the world at that time. A special role may be the NPC that's gathering the resources or carrying the boxes of supplies in the convoy, while the unscripted roles are the guards providing overwatch, either standing in a fixed position, wandering on a patrol path, or taking control of a mounted weapon. But in order for NPCs to have a role, they need to know not just what roles are available in a particular activity, but where they should be doing it. Hence, every activity has a set of posts attached to it. Each post is set by designers to identify what duties can be executed at that post. 
the locations they should execute the duty from, and the minimum number of NPCs that are required to satisfy it. Given you might need two or three NPCs to maintain Overwatch or patrol a region, there are different types of locations that can be attached to a post. Volumes for when they're gathering resources or guarding a region of the map, waypoint paths that are for patrol duties, and fixed points such as a mounted weapon. Whenever the active objective changes, the server attempts to assign NPCs that already have an active duty to a new one in context of the current task, but also prioritises what posts should be assigned. So mandatory posts that really help sell what these characters are doing are filled first, with other unfulfilled posts being populated depending on the makeup of the remaining NPCs. This all does a great job of reinforcing the performance theatre of the game. Characters know where in the world they should be standing and what their job is at that point in time. But what happens when an opposing faction appears, or the player in fact, and things start to kick off? Well, each NPC post does actually dictate whether or not it should be maintained in combat, and if so, they'll continue to operate the behaviour once the fighting starts. After all, there's no point standing around on that mounted gun if you're not going to use it. Plus, in the event an AI decides to execute a specific behaviour, the behaviour can dictate whether or not to release itself from a given post and get into the fight, and this provides a nice continuity between passive and active activity. So with this fairly extensive overhaul of the systems to facilitate the introduction of more dynamic and systemic AI throughout the open world, there were still some issues the team had to address, and much of that comes from the change of scenery. The, the openness of Washington was actually one of the biggest challenges we had coming from New York. I mean, it's not just the fact that the streets in New York are sort of narrow and you know high you know, skyscrapers on, bo on both sides of the street, high tall buildings, but it's also the, the amount of you know, traffic you expect to see with broken down cars and buses in New York meant that we had a lot of control over very long sight lines. So the, the combat tended to be you know, quite short range or mid range combat, even in the open world. And you get to, to Washington and we, you know, one of the things we wanted to, to show with Washington was you know, we wanted to introduce a diversity of environment that wasn't necessarily there in New York. We wanted wide boulevards, tree-lined boulevards. We wanted um, big, you know, grassy open spaces. We wanted sort of university type, you know, Queenstown type locations. And that put a pressure not just on the performance, as you mentioned, but actually put quite a bit of pressure on our NPCs, you know, NPC behaviors and our NPC systems. We hadn't really, you know, we'd, when we'd created the NPCs for Division, we had designed them around a sort of short to medium distance combat. And now something we had to deal with a lot longer you know, sight ranges. And what happens if you engage with a rusher at 60 meters away type thing? Are they just going to run towards you for 15 seconds? Uh, and then, you know, we didn't really want to increase our you know, budgets for the number of NPCs that we had in the game because we thought that the number of NPCs were working quite well in um, the Division 1. We wanted to, to maintain the budgets at about the same level, which meant that we had a problem then of what happens when you need to bring reinforcements into a fight. Because if you wait until you're almost, you've almost killed all of a group of NPCs, then by the time the reinforcements are spawned and come in, the player's been idle for, for several seconds. But spawning is a problem because you know, it's difficult to find a place that's out of line of sight of the player if the player's in a big open area. Uh, so it put a, quite a bit of pressure on our, our game design and our NPC behavior design, as well as performance. This resulted in a number of changes to how existing behaviors within the Division AI is executed. The first major change was that behaviors for archetypes were retooled such that they were more competent when fighting the player at range with archetypes having additional tweaks to their behaviour to compensate for the increased range. This leads to some novel cases, such as the Black Tusk's Rusher, which has an assault drone, so if the player is too far away, it won't expose itself and instead rely on the drone to attack you. The second major change to the systems was the NPCs would actively move around the open world. In the original game, NPCs would only move in very small groups, and even this was kept within fairly tight ranges in the map. Now convoys and control point attack units are moving through at a larger scale, but they also have a direction and goal to complete. This helps contextualise their position in the world, and either results in you sneaking up on them and catching them off guard, 
or accidentally bumping into them in the open world and creating a chaotic combat sequence. This all has a knock-on effect on managing the AI behaviour server side. As mentioned back in episode 35 of the main AI in game show, AI decision making happens server side and the client visualises these decisions on your PC or console. This resulted in the game's servers running low level simulations of where groups of NPCs are in the world and their objectives, spawning them into the game when necessary and despawning them should they complete a given task. But not only is the number of active NPCs increasing and the tasks they're being assigned more complex, there's also the issue of having them spread across a larger map. Division 2's map is pretty much a one-to-one -one reproduction of downtown Washington DC, stretching from Roosevelt Island and Georgetown in the west with the National Mall leading up to the Capitol building in the east. Totaling at around 4 square miles of map, it's an area that is around 30% larger than the original map of the division, which was of course a scaled reproduction of Midtown Manhattan. This resulted in a more aggressive level of detailing or LOD system compared to the first game. The LOD ensures the AI behaviour processing server side is minimised if players are not near them, as well as client side rendering and animation operating at lower levels of fidelity if they're clearly farther away. So this addresses the issues of map size and increasing the density of AI activity in the map, but this didn't resolve all the problems that emerged during development. There were still legacy problems emerging from working on the first division. Namely, that Manhattan has rather strict rules on how verticality is introduced to gameplay. Washington introduced challenges that were more than just the sightlines. We have a lot more uneven terrain. New York, for instance, was surprisingly flat. Um, or not surprising if you've been there, it is a very flat, like Manhattan is a very flat area. Um, but Washington is definitely not flat. And so that sort of, again, you know, pushed the NPCs into an area that we hadn't had to set of a whole new set of problems that we hadn't had to solve for for the division one you know to be able to handle you know NPCs fighting on slopes and and taking cover on slopes and doing you know climbing up onto trucks when the truck is on a slope that type of thing introduced a lot of you know sort of complexity there and then uh, in addition Washington is just so much more colorful than than New York was so you know we had to you know a lot spend a lot of do a lot of work with our um, NPC design, making sure that they were going to be visible in the different sort of environments that you, you find. But with all these improvements, it led to another issue. The increased sight lines meant that AI could more readily engage the player as they walked down open boulevards, but this leaves it open to a potential flaw in the enemy AI factions are much more likely to spot each other. It's, it's interesting, that added sort of an extra level of difficulty we hadn't initially expected. Um, the NPCs, because of the long, the, the open spaces, can generally see quite a long distance, and we needed to control, you know, how you know, to tweak how, you know, quickly they saw, saw the player or go into the player. But we ran into then a problem of the NPCs would very easily see each other moving through the world, and so you know we have all the different factions mixed in together, all moving through the world, heading to control points, heading to resources, and at, at one stage during development you know, this would all just break down because they, they would just spot each other from, you know, 100 metres away, get into a fight, kill each other, and, you know, the player would either get there and there'd be fighting going on, or the player would get there and there'd be, like, sort of, you know, one person left alive or something. So we actually had to, to, to dial down a lot of the, like, what we call the detection system, the, you know, the, the line of sight, the how quickly the NPCs go into combat, you know, those systems, we had to dial those down when it was faction versus faction, you know, sort of, um, you know, interacting with each other in the open world because we needed more control over that simulation. Building open world environments in games that feel lived in, that feel dynamic, is an increasingly demanding challenge as the scope of games being built continues to grow. The complexity of these characters and the ability to handle emergent gameplay as it happens in-game has no clear solution. But here we're seeing a natural iteration of the tools and systems from Tom Clancy's The Division alongside many of the interesting challenges that they've faced along the way. But there is still more to talk about on the AI of Tom Clancy's The Division 2. Next up, I'm going to take a look at one of the most powerful applications of artificial intelligence within the game that players never get a chance to see. The testing bots, whose job it is to play The Division during development that identify bugs or faults within the game. And I'll be telling you all about that 
in the next video. Thanks for watching this video on the AI of Tom Clancy's The Division 2 here on AI and Games. Once again, a special thanks to everyone at Massive Entertainment and Ubisoft for the opportunity to work with them on this project. And of course, to all my crowdfunding supporters on Patreon that make AI and Games a reality. Have a good one, folks. I'll be back.